The big wealthy business interests that control things and make all the important decisions. Forget the politicians. The politicians are put there to give you the idea that you have freedom of choice. You don't. You have no choice. You have owners. They own you. They own everything. They own all the important land. They own and control the corporations. They've long since bought and paid for the Senate, the Congress, the state houses, the city halls. They got the judges in their back pockets. And they own all the big media companies, so they control just about all of the news and information you get to hear. They, they spend billions of dollars every year lobbying, lobbying to get what they want. Well, we know what they want. They want more for themselves and less for everybody else. But I'll tell you what they don't want. They don't want a population of citizens capable of critical thinking. They don't want well-informed, well-educated people capable of critical thinking. They're not interested in that. That doesn't help them. That's against their interests. Like, why would you just use it on potential criminals or enemies of the state or what have you? Would you use it on the entire population and make trillions of dollars in avatars of revenue? Well, what about when you talk about something and then you get an ad for that something that you've never seen an ad for before? Of all the amazing things that the highbrow crowd at the Davos World Economic Forum has discussed on their annual agenda of talking about what to do with us. That's us. The people they get together once a year to sit around on a stage and chat about as if we're zoo animals they've been distantly observing that are completely segregated from them somehow, maybe like on a totally different planet. And them as in the people who rest of us never voted for, and most of us never even asked their opinion one single time, but seem to make an annual habit out of discussing what's to be done with us as if they've unilaterally decided they're just in charge of that somehow. Just chatting it up over there with the finger sandwiches and the Perrier talking about things like mind control. What we're trying to figure out is how to decode the signals of the brain. A future where elites own us through our biometric data. Control of data might enable human elites to do something even more radical than just build digital dictatorships. By hacking organisms, elites may gain the power to re-engineer the future of life itself. Uh, maybe the most eye-popping thing that we've personally heard over the years is this concept that in a few years from now, actually, we're all going to just own nothing and like it. On a quick aside, I don't know if you've seen what's happening out there with inflation, but the cost of living has gone to face palming your head through a cactus level of insane. Wall Street Journal and others are publishing stories about how entire neighborhoods of single family homes are being bought up at 20% over cost to either be turned into renter blocks or to sit around empty with price tags that laughingly price the average person just right the hell out altogether. So this country is being not so slowly turned into a giant land of permanent renters. I mean, here we've seen home costs go up at least threefold. And they got these dinky little houses with closets for bedrooms that shouldn't even be worth $100,000 being sold for $400,000 like the people who own them know literally no shame. I mean, we personally found out earlier this year just how little stability and security renters in this country actually have. Because we lived in the same home for three years and we'd always paid our rent early, or at the very least on time. And we were just up and kicked out with hardly any warning at all. And that's something as integral to living your life in this society as a home is, or at least a roof over your head. So you could probably better understand why we laughed our asses almost clear off when this Scandinavian lady gave a WEF presentation a few years ago talking about how everything is going to be rented in the future, right down to something as basic and small as a screwdriver to screw a screw into a wall. Why do you want to own your cell phone? I mean, you want the, you want the function, you want the service, right? Why do you want to own a cell phone if you can just lease it? And if you lease, why, why shouldn't you lease your refrigerator or your washing machine or your dishwasher or why do you want to own it? I mean, it's not like the plastic in the middle. It's like, you, I own it. You know how much a car drives? How much of its life? 4%. Or if you take a drill, it's used 15 minutes. It's not a lot, is it? And most of us, we, I know there are some guys here that really love to own a drill. Um, but for the rest of us, we just want a hole in a wall, right? Why don't you want to go into a business model where the company owns it? Why don't you want to go into a business model where the company owns it? Why don't you want to go into a business model where the company owns it? Why don't you want to go into a business model where the company owns it? Why don't you want to go into a business model where the company owns it?
want to go into a business model where the company owns it. I mean, yeah, why wouldn't you just want to go into a business model where you literally don't have anything at all? I mean, you know, it's like your body. You don't really need your DNA, right? Like, you don't really need the stuff in the middle. You just want the walking, talking machine, right? So, like, why do you even need to own that? You should just let the company own it. You should just let the companies own everything. They should just be like the new monarchs of the future. We just let them own us and everything else too. And we should literally have nothing at all. So that the power dynamic is absolutely 100% zero in our favor. That makes so much sense. That is brilliant. That, why didn't we all think of that? Why didn't we all just think of being slaves to corporations? Thing is, we've been talking about the authorization future for a long time on this channel. It just isn't as sexy a topic as aliens and UFOs. So it tends to make some people's eyes glaze over. But you can really start to see it happening out there now. The future we're talking about isn't based on some one-time authorization either. And it's Mealy Black Heart social credit is about continual reauthorization. So it'll be about the maintenance of your status. When I think about the flaming circus hoops the average person has to jump through just to qualify to rent a home here, and how prices have been continuously going up, and how even if you jump through all those hoops like an expert and get straight tins from the Olympic judging committee watching your performance, they could still kick you out on the street at the end anyway for whatever arbitrary reason they dream up, then try to wrap my mind around a time when continual reauthorization will play into everything including, I guess, the newly created privilege of being able to use a screwdriver when you need it. I'm really not sure how anyone could live, even remotely comfortably, in a world where they own nothing and, quote, like it. And, and I think we're going to a place where we just want mobility, where we don't care so much about owning a car. It's actually a bit of trouble. If, we, if you just come to drive a driverless car and pick me up and, and I can drive around and this car will be driving all the time. Things can be taken away at a whim, but even this parliament member from Davos writes about the pitfalls. Once in a while, she writes, I get annoyed about the fact that I have no real privacy. Nowhere can I go and not be registered. I know that. I know somewhere everything I do, think, and dream of is recorded. And dream of is recorded. I hope that no one will use it against me. Like living in a world where everything will be based on a digital passport system of inclusion or exclusion, based on an ever-shifting goalpost, based on whatever we're told is the greater good this week, and a world where even if you play by all of those rules, you could still be voted off the island anyway for wearing an ugly hat or using an off-limits word or having an off-limits thought or whatever reason they come up with next because, well, you hold none of the cards. You aren't even allowed to own a card, let alone the many cards it would necessitate to play the game because you literally have no power in that relationship whatsoever. And if you're someone who isn't new to this channel, then you'll probably recall in the years leading up to 2020 how I would often wonder aloud in our videos, how would they get the masses to accept such ridiculous living conditions? And I don't mean living conditions, I mean the condition upon which they're going to try and get people to live. I think it's starting to become, it's starting to become all too clear exactly how. Enter Meta. Hey, and welcome to Connect. Today, we're going to talk about the metaverse. You know I was going to have to go here. Facebook, as you have likely heard, because the ads are everywhere now, including the movie theater, they announced right before Halloween that they officially changed their name to Meta, short for Metaverse. Now, the best way to understand the Metaverse is to experience it yourself, and how we actually experience the world and interact with each other. Experience the world, experience experiences. You're going to be able to move across these different experiences in the experience. You're going to be in these experiences many of the most immersive experiences, just a fundamentally different experience, you can start to see how the metaverse is going to enable richer experiences and really bring them into these shared experiences. Now, there's a lot that needs to get built to create experiences like this. New experiences that you're having to a completely different set of experiences, experiences in the metaverse. Different kinds of metaverse experiences, the most important experience of all, experiences. The system has promised all of this equality, and this right here is looking like the only place where people will ever get to have anything even remotely close, and actually not really, because in reality they'll only get to have a digital pretend world made up of digital non-existent stuff. 
So if the reality of the World Economic Forum ladies' wet dreams comes true, by 2030, they'll be renting their outrageously overpriced IKEA tiny home timeshare with a bunch of total strangers who also won't own their own screwdrivers either. But hey, at least they'll spend all their days with VR goggles strapped to their heads, walking around in a Second Life 2.0 wannabe world, dressed up like Digi Xena Warrior Princess, living in a digital McMansion in Mark Zuckerberg's metaverse, which he and his co-workers have decided to tell us all about in an hour-plus presentation with a plethora of completely off-putting, unnatural TED Talk arms. You're gonna be able to gesture with your hands. While they read buzzword-filled scripts to each other that really do sound like they were generated by an AI and not written by an actual person. What about unlocking more mixed reality experiences? We're already seeing the potentials of these kinds of experiences today as people are building for a pass-through API. Creators who make digital objects, creators who offer services and experiences. Building AR experiences that empower people. We're gonna need to help build the skill sets of the people who build these experiences. Creators are helping us build these experiences. Allow people to use their hands more naturally in more virtual experiences. Tell me all about it. The metaverse means experiences you can have. It's even more off-putting, which is a phrase I might decide to use at least five more times in this video. How many times Zuckerberg uses words like natural to describe this cheesy looking ersatz digital world replacement that Silicon Valley plans to shuffle people into as they attempt to shift society into a phase where they expect us and plan us to conduct more and more of our lives in virtual spaces as we're increasingly expected to rarely leave our homes. Connecting socially, entertainment, games, work, is gonna be more natural and vivid of interacting with devices that are much more natural. And if we do leave, not to go very far. I just wanna point out really quick, the logo there is an illusion. It's the appearance of a twisted infinity symbol. It's actually a hollow circle. And Microsoft, of course, came out within days to announce they're also going to build a Bill Gates version of Metaverse for Teams which they're eerily calling mesh, like a giant digital net they've trapped reality in. Because if there's one thing that will make all of those mostly pointless meetings at work go by faster, it's gotta be sitting around in a fake office in fake outer space while your boss and coworkers yarn on and on about stuff you'll be sure to pay even less attention to when it's coming out of the cartoon mouth of a digital avatar dressed like a giant robot than you would if you actually had to sit there in physical reality and physically listen to any of it in the actual world. But I'm genuinely optimistic about work in the metaverse. I'm here at my desk where I experience experiences. But that's what certain billionaires apparently expect to happen in the not too distant future where everything from viruses to climate change are justifications to dictate how little we're allowed to access and experience the natural outside world. It's like all those science fiction movies from Body Snatchers to Step for Wives are actually on the verge of sorta of kinda of coming true, but in a much lamer way. We've talked about it before you remember the 2009 Bruce Willis movie Surrogates, right? The plot revolved around a high-tech future where the majority deemed the world too dangerous and scary to physically exist in, in the day-to-day, -day, so everyone just opted to stay inside the safety of their own homes and send more attractive, physically fit, remote-controlled humanoid robot versions of themselves out into society that they could live vicariously through instead. And there's actually a company out there working on those. But in the meantime, this is what we're being offered. Who is a good persistent state virtual object layered on an interactive pass-through environment? Oh, you are. Entrance into Meta is even called Horizon Home. As in your home is as far as your eye can see. You're going to be able to invite people over, play games and hang out. Uh, you'll also even have a home office where you can work. Your home is your personal space. And you may be thinking to yourself, who cares? Facebook sucks, I don't have a Facebook account, I don't plan on getting one. To reflect who we are and what we hope to build, I am proud to announce that starting today, our company is now Meta. Our mission remains the same, it's still about bringing people together. But now we have a new North Star to help bring the metaverse to life. And we have a new name that reflects the full breadth of what we do and the future that we want to help build. From now on, we're going to be metaverse first, not Facebook first. That means that over time, you won't need to use Facebook to use our other services. 
Over time, I hope that we are seen as a metaverse company. But Bill Gates has already come out to say that within three years, all these virtual meetings that people are having now due to the vid are gonna be happening in the metaverse. And as we've all witnessed over the course of the pandemic in the last two years, they can easily shift the way society conducts its business and force people to use technologies they otherwise wouldn't choose to on their own, because that's already been happening. And this is all a part of what's been deemed the Great Reset, right? The main ad for Meta also has that theme, the Great Reset theme, the death and rebirth of society at large symbolically written all over it. I used to love studying classics, and the word Meta comes from the Greek word meaning beyond. Nothing you see in these kinds of commercials is accidental. If it's in the presentation anywhere, it's there for a reason, and you don't have to take my word for that this time. In a world where people tend to overlook symbolism as reading too much into things, if you point it out, Zuckerberg or someone working with him really wanted to make sure people understood that symbolism was being purposefully employed here. Because at one point in his presentation, he's sitting in front of a bookshelf, and of the few books whose titles are legible, you can clearly see he has a copy of Tashin's Book of Symbols prominently featured there on the shelf. So, despite the fact that symbols can mean all kinds of things, depending on who you ask and why, we're going to go ahead and reference that book, as he's clearly blinging it here as a go-to. So you have this ad that they've been, they put it everywhere. They put it at the top of YouTube. They put it in movie theaters. It's probably on TV. I don't have, but I'm assuming. And in it, you have this group of millennials who have just come from a room in an art museum where the art portrays the sun shining. In fact, the one on the right that's only seen for a brief moment as the woman steps out of the way actually shows a sun on top of a pyramid. There's actually a presentation on the TED Talk uh, by a, a guy five years ago titled Atlantis and the Roots of Egypt, and he's claiming they've run all of this stuff through computer models and that the Great Pyramid at Cheops was originally crowned by a 2.7 meter gold sphere equivalent to the mathematical number E, which was meant to symbolize the Eye of Horus that he theorized through his computerized mathematical models used to be used as a form of worship of the sun and the star Sirius. But I digress. These people are mesmerized by this painting that's in front of them of a tiger attacking a buffalo. And there's some really old folk tales regarding the tiger and the buffalo. There's a Chinese version, a Vietnamese version, which teaches how the tiger got his stripes. But personally, I'm guessing the reason this painting was chosen is more about the circumstances under which it was painted. It's entitled Fight Between a Tiger and a Buffalo, and it was completed by French artist Henri Rousseau in 1908. And according to the Cleveland Museum of Art, Rousseau worked on the painting while he was in prison for fraud. And the thing is, is Rousseau himself never left France. So we're told that his inspiration for this tropical jungle scene was all done purely from his imagination after reading travel books and visiting the local botanical gardens. So what you have in essence is a man who's never been to the jungle himself, painting something purely from his imagination while locked in a prison cell. And that's the artwork they chose to introduce you to this meta, which I feel is more than a little disturbing. It's a life much like the one the World Economic Forum and its Great Reset describes for all of us in the future, where we won't really be expected to leave our homes for work or school, or hanging out with family, or visiting, or, tr or travel. I mean, they're talking about that all the time now. But that's okay, right? Because using our VR goggles in the meta, we can go anywhere. You're going to really feel like you're there with other people. This is the dimension of imagination. But back to this commercial, there's a lot more going on here than just a tiger attacking a buffalo in the uncanny valley of oversized jungle plants and googly-eyed dancing animals. After these people venture out into the painting a little ways, they're greeted by an owl which a lot of people know as a symbol of wisdom, but which the Tashin book that Zuckerberg owns points out is actually known the world over as the consort of death. And so we've got this book as well, of course, and the entry on owls talks about how they have extremely keen vision. Thus, it is not surprising that owls have become symbols of both acute awareness, the invisible seer in the dark, the bird of crafty skill that accompanies Athena, Greek goddess of civilization, protector of Athens, and of the stunning power of death. 
mortal terror of the stealthy visitor in the night. In Germany and Eastern Europe, an owl alighting on a dwelling or barn is deemed to foreshadow an imminent death. And this association extends across most of the world, including, for example, the alliance in Native American mythology of the owl with skeleton man, the god of death. But as often the powers of death are also the powers of transformation, and the owl is symbolically bound to the renewal of life that is mythically implicit in death. Once the owl flies up, you see in the back of the painting that the sun is now setting and the moon is rising over the water. Again, the sun and moon are mentioned in Tashin as symbols of the eyes of Horus. So that would be the second time that's come up. In addition, the moon and the water are two very distinct symbols representing the subconscious mind. And in the water, we see what looks like a gate and the reflection of that gate in the water makes a hexagonal structure. And beyond it, taking up most of the sky, is Saturn. The hexagon being an appropriate symbol for Saturn if you've ever seen pictures of its pole. In other words, it looks like we're being invited to the portal of Saturn. Now, Tashin's Book of Symbols only references Saturn twice. Once as a picture of Saturn devouring one of his sons with no further commentary under the entry for the symbolism of the mouth, as a reference to the engulfing jaws of death, as if Saturn is just going to devour us all. And the other is on the page for the entry on the symbolism of prison, which is now the second time prison has come up in this short ad. Here on this page about prison, it talks about alchemy depicting Saturn as the governor of the prison in which sulfur, the motivating spirit of both will and compulsion was bound. Saturn is associated with lead, cold, and the darkest time of year, implying the weight of limiting circumstances by which our soaring aspirations are shackled. Kind of an interesting symbol to show us for a place where they claim we can do anything, right? Instead of looking at a screen, you're going to be in these experiences. And then it talks about the literal sense of what prison symbolizes and that at the bleakest level, it's nothing more than the soul getting trammeled not only by incarceration, but degradation, violation, and false arrest. So that is the reference in this book in regards to Saturn. Manly P. Hall further elaborates on Saturn in his work, The Secret Teachings of All Ages. He says, to the initiate, the skeleton of death holding in bony fingers the reaper's scythe denotes Saturn, Kronos, the father of the gods, carrying the sickle with which he mutilated Uranus, his own sire. In the language of the mysteries, and this is in italics, the spirits of men are the powdered bones of Saturn. The latter deity was always worshipped under the symbol of the base or footing, inasmuch as he was considered to be the substructure upholding creation. Hall then continues with a few paragraphs of allegory regarding the mystery of human evolution of the spirit and souling matter that eventually becomes man and raises him to the estate of the gods, which sounds an awful lot like the promise of transhumanism. Shots of Saturn are also prominently featured in other meta videos, including the main presentation where at one point a little girl and her grandma go into meta and literally take a virtual trip to Saturn. Actually, I have to write this paper. Will you help me? Let's take a closer look. What part of the solar system are we talking about? Saturn. Just in case the symbolism hasn't been picked up on any of the other times it's been shown, which is a lot. An image of this moment where these two are staring at Saturn from the perspective of the viewer, which means the viewer is also staring at Saturn, was also sent out as the official announcement of the name change on the Meta Newsroom's Twitter account. And right after the name change was announced, too, just by the way, a hashtag went momentarily viral on social media Hashtag Facebook dead, because apparently the word meta is pronounced like the feminine form of the Hebrew word for dead. And so that was going around the media as well. And just in case you weren't absolutely sure, I mean, this has really hit you over the head amount of confirmation of symbolism, repeated symbolic elements. Hey, are you coming? Yeah, just gotta find something to wear. This is probably the reason why Zuckerberg's wardrobe, because he's talking about how we can have all these outfits in meta, his wardrobe consists of his usual black shirt and pants, but also a skeleton suit, just like the Native American mythology mentioned in Tashin suggests. 
and an astronaut suit, you know, for when you go to Saturn or whatever. So it isn't my abundance of symbolism, but former Facebooks that Meta will be some kind of digital door to the underworld. Well known in mythology to be a place where death and rebirth initiations are said to take place. And I just want to point out too that these people in this commercial kind of look like they're being forced to dance against their will. I mean, I mean, take out this upbeat music and slow it all down a little and you tell me what's happening here. Because whatever it is, it kind of looks uncomfortable. And I get that they're making reality seem horrible right now, so that nobody will want to deal with it at all. But unless they're just joshing us here, I don't understand how they're going to get everyone to just accept reality being replaced so we can all live in the Ready Player One trailer park and hang out in what my friend Amy calls these 90s PlayStation graphics. Truly, I mean no disrespect when I ask this, but are they hiding the real tech somewhere in the back and presenting us with something they came up with 20 years ago just to see if we'll bite? Because Tupac's hologram back in 2012 blows all of this stuff they're showing in the presentation away. And that was, you know, 10 years ago. Heck, 70s Star Trek makes this look old, okay? And there's just something incredibly creepy about Zuckerberg talking about how much fun it will be for users to set stuff on fire and shoot people in the immersive virtual reality he refers to as feeling oh so natural in games they're working on for the platform like Grand Theft Auto. I'm excited to announce that the Rockstar Games classic Grand Theft Auto San Andreas is in development for Quest 2. This new version of what I think is one of the greatest games ever made will offer players an entirely new way to experience this iconic open world in virtual reality. 